about the role of citagliptin in type 2 diabetes patient, and we will take you through a case to help you understand how uh, this works out. So, uh, so this is a case of newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, a 42-year-old male. Uh, by 42-year-old, he's obviously not at a particularly high risk of heart disease at the moment. Newly diagnosed with diabetes during an annual health checkup. He has a sales job. He's traveling all the time. He has an irregular lifestyle, so might find drinking a lot of fluids or taking care of genital hygiene very difficult. He's not a hypertensive smoker or alcoholic, which makes him fairly low risk of cardiovascular disease. So he's got normal blood pressure and pulse, no other relevant findings, but importantly, his BMI is on the lowish side at 24 kilo kilogram per meter square. His lab reports, fasting plasma glucose of 186, post of 254, with the HbA1c of 8.1%. Now, remember this 8.1% because this is the commonest range, you know, 7.5 to 8.5 is the commonest range of, diag of HbA1c at diagnosis that we see not only in India, but across the world. So uh, what do we do next? We try and get his blood sugar controlled quickly and optimally and make sure he can stay on the same medication for a long period of time and yet prevent all the long-term diabetes complications. Now to come into a little bit more of the theory, this is known as the egregious 11 and this is how diabetes is supposed to be evolving. There is a failure of beta cell function, there is hyperglycemia, there is incretin alpha cell defect. In addition, there are problems with insulin resistance in the liver, the muscle, and adipose tissue. More and more, we are finding that there are problems with the colon, with problems with the gut biome. There is immune dysregulation, there is problems with the stomach and small intestine, and also problems in the brain. So all these things are conspiring together to lead to diabetes. So naturally, for any kind of disease, what do we do? We try and address the pathophysiology. Whatever is causing the disease, we try and address that defect to try and get the best results of treatment for that condition. And if you look at this, if you look at the various parameters that we can treat, beginning from the pancreatic beta cell failure, to the incretin or alpha cell defect, to the problems with the stomach, small intestine, and the immune dysregulation, and in the colon, one thing that figures prominently is DPP-4 inhibitors, and this actually influences the way the disease is modified. So DPP-4 inhibitors, in general, and citagliptin in particular, is a molecule which would address the various pathophysiological defects of diabetes. And now when you're trying to manage any chronic condition, what you are trying to do is address the pathophysiology. So if you look at the 11 egregious defects of diabetes, most of them are addressed by DPP-4 and a combination of metformin, which will, of course, be looking at the insulin resistance side of things. So not only that, we need other ways of looking at diabetes as well. In a sense, we need to look at specific factors like A1C targets, like weight, blood pressure, lipids. We need to think of other co uh, coexisting diseases. We need to look at conditions which can be prevented. We can kidney disease, liver disease, all these things are taken into consideration when we manage diabetes. But primarily, the first thing that we look at when we start treating diabetes is the efficacy of the molecule. And if you look at the efficacy of citagliptin across the spectrum of disease, whether you look at it early diabetes when you're treating with the monotherapy, or whether you're moving on in the course of the disease when you're moving to dual therapy or triple therapy, or you're going on to treatment with insulin, you find the treatment with citagliptin leads to an improvement of HbA1c across the board, all with an additional reduction of fasting plasma glucose, which remains statistically significant across the spectrum of the disease, with the HbA1c reduction of roughly 0.5 to 0.9 percent, which is quite significant. Now, not only that, you, when you combine it with metformin, 
you find that there is a very strong HbA1c reduction. This is a comparison between uh, metformin and a combination of uh, citagliptin and metformin. You find that there is a difference in 0.8 percent over and above what you get with metformin. And in addition to that, you get when the HbA1c is particularly high, you have HbA1c of more than 9 percent, you get an infinitely more uh, reduction of HbA1c to the tune of about 3.5 percent, which is a huge amount, you will agree. In addition, you get other benefits with this. I'm sorry. You, in addition, this is extremely well tolerated. Never forget the fact that incremental doses of metformin leads to dropout of patients from metformin. Metformin dropout is actually as high as 10% in patients. So you be careful about the GI side effects of metformin. And you can add in a glyptin to a metformin to prevent the GI side effects. And as this stu study very elegantly shows us, that there is a reduction in the number of GI side effects when you add uh, it's glyptin to metformin. In addition, the group that I told you the most, the group 7.5 to 8.5 HbA1c, you see a statistically strongly significant HbA1c reduction in this group across the board with citagliptin and metformin. And if you think of the competitor, something like a glimepiride, you find that there is a similar HbA1c reduction all along the way with citagliptin when you compare it with glimepiride. Add to that, you get the advantage of a weight reduction. There is definite weight reduction with citagliptin when you compare it with the sulfonylurea. And this, as you see, the difference is pretty large to a total of about 2 kilogram compared to the drug and about 0.8 kilograms when you compare it to placebo. And in addition, you get the benefit of no risk of additional hypoglycemia with similar HbA1c lowering. So, you know, metformin and then the next line of therapy, citagliptin seems to be fitting the bill beautifully. Not only that, it is extremely durable. Now, if you look at this beautiful paper by D. Rosa, this is sulfonylurea and metformin. Of course, citagliptin is signified by S. As you can see, at 60 months, HbA1c is starting to drift with sulfonylureas, as is the body weight. But with citagliptin, the weight is maintained as well as the HbA1c reduction is maintained. This is not only with uh, citagliptin and uh, uh, sulfonylurea, a similar reduction is maintained with pioglitazone and also in a situation when you compare with pioglitazone and sulfonylurea and citagliptin and sulfonylurea, you see a similar kind of HbA1c reduction which is maintained. Now in a chronic disease where the patient is going to receive treatment for a whole long period of time, it is imperative the patient gets a drug which is completely durable. You know, this will mean that the patient will need to change medications less often and will continue to be maintained on the same medication. Remember, diabetes, we have very few drugs at our disposal, about three or four. And if you can maintain a patient with a particular drug over a prolonged period of time, this is a definite advantage of the molecule. Add to that, the TCOS study, though it did not come out as a positive as far as cardiovascular outcomes is concerned, showed us some very interesting signals. There was no risk of severe uh, hypoglycemia. The story of pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer was completely laid to rest with no increased risk of pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. There was no increased risk of serious adverse events. And in fact, the concern that gliptins or citagliptin in particular causes musculoskeletal disorders and body joint pains, etc., was also laid to rest with no increased risk of musculoskeletal and connective tissue disorders. However, there was this question about cardiovascular outcome trials, and as you can see, this is the first lot of cardiovascular outcome trials that we had reviewed, and you can make out that there was no increased risk. So this was as good as placebo, or as bad as placebo, whatever way you want to look at it. Suffice to say, citagliptin usage was not associated with any 
adverse cardiovascular outcome. And if you look at retrospective analysis, it seems that there was a reduction of cardiovascular events with the usage of TPP4 inhibitors, which included citagliptin, vildagliptin, and all other drugs. So where do cigliptins fit in in CV disease? Citagliptin and linagliptin we know are completely safe. You can use it across the board in all patients, irrespective of their cardiac status. You do not need to worry that it will worsen the situation. Wildagliptin, there is no data. Vivid trials seem to be indicating that there is an increased risk of diastolic dysfunction. Saxagliptin, there is a noise about heart failure. Allogliptin, there is a noise of heart failure. Tenelagliptin, there is no data, but there is definite data showing increased QT prolongation. So this is cardiovascular disease. Now we come to renal disease, which is something that afflicts a large portion of our patients with uh, diabetes. And as you can see in patients with severe renal disease, it is comparable to glipizide in reducing HbA1c. But not only is it comparable to glipizide, a sulfonylurea, which has traditionally been felt to be a very strong antihyperglycemic molecule, what it also does is it comes to the table without an increased risk of hypoglycemia. So citagliptin in a dose of 50 milligrams in moderate to severe renal impairment is as good or, in fact, superior, I would say, because it does not cause any hypoglycemia. In patients with end-stage dialysis, even then you get to see a marked reduction of HbA1c maintained across the board over a prolonged period of time with no increased risk of hypoglycemia, which is, again, a superiority which you see compared to a sulfonylurea. The TCOS study, in fact, showed no extended benefit in as much of reduction of uh, doubling of serum creatinine, but it definitely showed an improvement in albuminuria. Now, I think there's a lot of noise about the Carmelina and the Carolina studies showing some degree of improvement of albuminuria, but a similar result was seen with the TCOS study, but it was not an uh, adjudicated endpoint, and therefore it is not mentioned very strongly. However, suffice to say that it is one of the most simply used one of the drugs with the strongest evidence for use, particularly in patients with renal disease. The idea that linagliptin is the only renal gliptin is probably wrong. Linagliptin is the drug which doesn't need dose adjustment, but with dose adjustment, all the gliptins are safe, and citagliptin in a dose of 50 milligrams can be used across the board in the diabetic nephropathy with extremely positive benefits. So we come back to the patient. This patient was started on clipton and metformin and was followed up. And when the patient comes back for follow-up, blood sugars are coming down, 7.4. He's maintained on the same medication. Now look at the durability of the treatment, 6.3%, blood sugars under control. And again, he comes back after two years. Again, the blood sugars have remained well under control. He's continuing on the same medication. And this is, of course, a huge advantage because the patient doesn't need to change medications. Now, the ADA EAST guidelines and all the other guidelines have now been pretty categorical in stating that, you know, the first line therapy has to be metformin plus minus GLP-1, SGLT-2. And the evidence with that is convincing. There is no doubting that evidence. But what one tends to forget and one should remember and one should highlight repeatedly and very strongly is that the large number of areas where gliptin still continue to have a proud pride of place, where gliptin still continue to be given a first-line therapy. It reduces the risk of hypoglycemia. It reduces weight gain or, in fact, probably causes a little bit of weight loss as well. And now gliptins, particularly citagliptin, has become quite affordable. In fact, if you look at the cardiovascular side of things and CKD side of things, it has been shown to be used interchangeably with GLP-1 receptor analogs. So I think the role of citagliptin across the spectrum of disease from start to finish, whether the patient is just starting off being diabetic to the point of time when he starts to get complications or is at risk of complications, remains imprinted in the minds of physicians and is always a benefit for patients with diabetes. Thank you very much for listening.